Well, hi again, and welcome to another video from Mad About Madeira. Um, hmm. Let me show you guys a little something. Um, you know why I look at? I guess you guys, it's my little office for now, and I tend to do a lot of these videos, I guess maybe because I'm bored at work sometimes and thoughts just come to my mind. So I'm not sitting at home doing these videos most of the times. But take a quick look at something. Uh, that's the view that I have right now. Uh, this is here in South Florida, looking straight ahead over those bushes, about 10 miles down, would be about, would be the city of Fort Lauderdale, okay? So I'm here at the office. Normally I'm downstairs on the first floor doing these videos, but I guess I'll show you guys a treat today. So, so here I am. So today, what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about something here that, um... I've touched on in a couple of my earlier videos, and as you can realize, I'm sometimes just repeating things I may have done in earlier videos, but sometimes coming with new thoughts, elaborations, clarifications, and this happens to be one of those. Well, here is what's going on. Um, the thought about moving to a place like Portugal, Madeira specifically. When I came back, and even up to this very day when I mention it to people that it's a place that I want to move to, and when I say people, I'm referring to people, um, you know, black folks. And I, I hate to always keep mentioning color and all of that, but we're in the United States, all right? And that's still a big thing over here. There's still designations, black people, white people, all that good stuff. So this has nothing to do with me having any issues with either group of people, or anyone for that matter, but it's just for the sake of designation so you could know where I'm coming from when I make these points. So, um, when I came back, one second, let me get some uh, the window down. It's very humid here in South Florida. Um, but I don't want to have the engine on because when I do, then you guys tend to hear the humming of the engine um, coming through. But anyway, once I came back and I told people that I went over there, that wasn't so much of a big deal, but it's when I talk about moving over there, I tend to get a few responses. One response is, um, and this is understandable, um, some people ask the question, they'll ask it straight out, or they will kind of butter it up a bit, and they will say things like, you know, how do they feel about us? You know, referring to people of my color or black people, as we would say over here. What do they think about us? Um, another friend asked me, how are race relations over there? Um, so I get those groups. I also get the other people who are like, <laughs> people who are not geographically sound. When the Ukrainian war broke out, was like, hey, why are you going to go over to Portugal? Because we went over there around the same time. Like, why are you going to go over there? Um, isn't that right next door to where the war is going on? And I'm like, uh, no, not really, you know. It's on the same continent, but it's not close by, you know. Relatively speaking, you could say. But it's not like it's just across the border. So I have those groups of people who are not even aware of where Portugal is at on a map or what is close to it, you know, what it's, you know, in relation, how close it is to other nations around them. Then I have the other group of people, and these are the group of people I guess I want to address today. Um, those people who are more militant, who know their history, and they want to basically point out to me, like, or mention to me, or question me, like, why would I want to go to a place like Portugal? And when they say that, they may not come out and say it, or they may say it in a form or fashion, but it's more or less like, why do you want to go to that country? Do you know what that country did to our ancestors? And I think when they're talking to me, they think they're talking to someone who's completely um, lost in terms of the history of um, Portugal. You know, it's dark side of its history in terms of it um, engaging in the slave trade and basically this transatlantic slave trade and basically kickstarting that, you know, and the various things that went on, the colonization, the subjugation of various peoples and all of that. I think they think I'm lost of that. Of course, I'm aware of all of that, you know, so... The other thing that they will do, I have a part, um, one particular family member, and he is what we call a Rastafarian. That's those guys with, in case you might not know, the guys with the dreadlocks. And you have a lot of people who have that as a style, um, but he, it's for him, it's a lifestyle. 
So in his world, he tends to look at Africa in a more spiritual light. You know, he's not just thinking of Africa in terms of it being the motherland, but he's looking at it more in a spiritual light in the sense that he believes from the Bible and using the Bible based on the Bible that somehow Africa is blessed by God, that the people who are there or their descendants, you know, their, their diaspora around the world are like God's favored people and that we're favored. Um, and you know what? I spoke about this in my last video. There's this kind of a belief that if one group feels special or favored, they have to look at another group of people as not being favored so that their favor can seem more special. So he is that type of person um, where it's like the Europeans are evil, they're bad, you know, white folks are out to this and they're that and they're this. So we black folks are special and we're going through whatever we're going through because they're wicked and evil and they're trying to oppress us and suppress us. And, and of course, you know, he goes back showing the proof of this in, in history. And of course, there are examples of those type of things happening, obviously. The transatlantic slave trade, um, the whole colonization process. He has more than enough fodder to look at to prove his point that they are this and we are that. Well, anyway, he jokes about it or hints about it or there's some sarcasm like, oh, you want to go ahead and you want to be um, associated with your European side, you know, and you're, you're, you're like scorning Africa, more or less saying like, why aren't you going to Africa? Why are you trying to go to some other country in Europe? You know, why aren't you going to your people instead of going over to those people? So. The silliness aside, when it comes to that, um, just want to talk about a few things here. So he looks at it like there is some kind of a calling for the black man to come back to Africa. You know, it's like there is something written in the stars or in the Bible that, that God is going to call back his people to Africa after 400 years. So one day I got a call from him and I guess he was really excited because the president of Ghana at the time in 2019 had made a proclamation calling it the year of return. And the year of return was supposed to be something where the, the president of, of Ghana was traveling throughout the world or to the, throughout the diaspora. He went to Guyana, where my wife is from. Um, I think he went to Barbados in the Caribbean. And I think he went to some places here in the United States to speak to the diaspora or the, 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 the black population outside of Africa. And he was basically saying, listen, I'm opening up my country for you guys to come back home. After 400 years, you can come back home. Now, that 400 years, it's, it's very, um, very symbolic, okay? Or it's important in the scheme of things because there's this belief based on the biblical story of the Exodus that the children of Israel were in bondage for 400 years in Egypt. Some of these people have gone ahead and spiritualized this and say the 400 years of slavery on this side of the world is symbolic of that and that after 400 years, God has freed his people, Africans or black people, and now there's this call for them to come back home to Africa because Africa is seen as the promised land, okay? Just like in the biblical story, Israel was seen as the promised land to the Israelites. So Africa is seen as the promised land for black folks. So with this in mind, when the president of Ghana made this proclamation, for those people like this family member who sees things and filters it through a biblical lens, believe that was a fulfillment of what was going to, what was what the Bible predicted even though there's no prediction about that, but that after 400 years, God is going to call his people back home, and the people back home are people of African descent. Well, I hate to break the news to him, or I had to break the news to him. I said, it had nothing whatsoever to do with what you think it, it, it had to do with. It had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with economics. Everything to do with economics. And I got to give the African president um, some 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 skill for his imagination and for, for coming up with the concept because it's like, hmm, there are people out here that believe 
that after 400 years, you know, the bondage is going to end and they should come back home to their motherland. How can I work this in a marketing campaign? So what he basically did was this. You have to understand what's going on in Ghana. Ghana, like a lot of, like, well, just about everywhere else in Africa in terms of the modern world, are, you know, these places are relatively new countries. The people are not new. The tribes who are there, the people that make up the continent are not new. They've been around for thousands of years. But for, the most, of, for most of Africa, the great majority of Africa, excluding Ethiopia, are relatively new nations. Relatively new. They're still going through their growing pains. They're still going through periods of growth and the civil tension and everything that goes with nation building if you want to follow the path of the Europeans who had been warring for hundreds of years, beating each other up until they finally came to a point where we need to stop this mess and in some way come up with some sort of a unity, uh, seeing what happened with Napoleon and then what happened with Adolf Hitler trying to take over. The nations were like, no, no, we're not going to have this anymore. We're going to go ahead and unite to prevent this type of stuff from one person trying to overtake the whole continent. Well, Africa is more or less going through that right now. Remember, these are still very young nations, okay? And they're coming from way behind the eight ball after the Europeans, um, you know, some European kingdoms um, helped to depopulate some areas and then colonization, the underdevelopment and everything. So coming from a long way. And in the process, they're growing. So there are the coups, there's the tension, there's the tribal infighting and all the different things that go on um, in what has been, how nations have been built over the centuries. So Ghana happens to be one of those countries. For right now, on the outside, it seems like a stable country. For the most part, it is. They've had two major coups uh, during their existence since the country came into, came into existence back in, I think, the late 1950s. They've had two major coups. And as a result, um, they have now been stable for quite some time. And when we say stable, we're talking about they have not had any military coups or anything like that. But the country is still teetering. Okay? All is not well. At any given moment, anything can pop off. Their economy is still struggling. Um, you know, there's still things, some things going on there. The infrastructure is still not the greatest that you can find. Um, they're still having some struggles. So what did they have to do to try to get out from these situations? They went ahead and they borrowed money from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Well, guess what? Ghana defaulted in those, on that loan. And so now they owe money. And now they're in a quagmire because it's like they need money to develop their country, but afraid to go back to the IMF to ask for another loan when they defaulted on the first loan. So what did this Af the, um, the Ghanaian president come up with? He came up with this idea that, listen... I need to find money somewhere. I need to find money. I need to find a different way how I can get money into my country. And so he came up with this concept. Um, him and his cabinet or whoever came up with this idea. Listen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and start a campaign and start advertising it to the black diaspora. That's the black people who are living in other parts of the world. And we're going to tell them, come back to Ghana. We'll give you land. We'll make life easy for you. We'll go ahead and try to make it make it easy for you to come back over here and just basically start a new life in Ghana. So if you notice, and for those of you who may not know, you started seeing videos of celebrities like Oprah Winfrey, like Steve Harvey, Jay-Z, Beyonce, various, you know, and so, sometimes second level celebrities going over and promoting Ghana. Hey, I was in Ghana. I went to visit Ghana. And some of them are like, hey, I took my DNA test and it led me back to, to this place, Ghana, where my, my, my ancestors came from. And there was this excitement. And that was all a part of the plan. Get celebrities to start going over there, talking about Ghana, filming themselves in Ghana. And hopefully the rest of the black population would see this and say, wow, hey, you know, Oprah Winfrey's over there. You know, Steve Harvey is over there. Hey, you know, Jay-Z went over there. Beyonce, let's go over and see what it's really all about. Then the next set of people that were, were targeted were people like the influencers. Come on over, bring your camera, do some YouTube videos, talk about living in Ghana, life in Ghana, enjoying yourself in Ghana, showing a different side of Ghana, like the, the nightlife, beautiful homes, which these places do have. You know, come on over, show people that you're having fun, enjoying yourself, and you're going to entice people to come on over. And the last group of people were people who were disillusioned with the United States, black folks 
disillusioned, just like I am to some extent, disillusioned, sick and tired of the racism, sick and tired of just black folks seem like they're just not going anywhere or getting a leg up. Well, hey, you can come on over to Ghana where you will be amongst people who look just like you and we'll give you 40 acres and a mule and you can start a new life all over. Those were the people who actually went to Ghana, not the celebrities. And when I say went to, I'm talking about living. The celebrities went over, did the photo ops and all that stuff and came back over to the big mansions and this is where they're living, right? They didn't go to Ghana and say, I'm going to build a big house over there, move over there, live over there, or anything like that. But the people who were disillusioned, who could barely make it over here in this country, decide to go and flee to places like Ghana. So now, four years later, you're starting four or five years later, you're starting to see the videos, why so many African Americans are leaving Ghana. And why? Because... When you got there, you realize what you thought was going to be the situation did not turn out to be the situation. You go over there and for the United States and all the issues they may have, you have certain creature comforts, right? Go home, you have central air, you flip it on, it's on. You have a cable issue with your cable or something is going on at your home. You call up, you make an appointment, they tell you to be there between 2 and 4 or 2 and 5. They show up at some time around that time. They come in to take care of your issues. The red tape, the bureaucracy, sometimes even though you may deal with a certain amount of that here, um, it's not nearly as bad. You can go online, you can do your banking, you can do this. You don't have to leave your house to do half of the things. You can go to Amazon, order something, it's there the next morning or sometimes the same day, you know. You have all these luxuries and conveniences. You have a Walmart in every corner, a Publix, depending on where you live, a Kroger, supermarket around every corner. They're all around. You have 10 hospitals nearby. You have your major airports not too far away. You have all of these different things, especially for the black population that tend to live in urban, um, urban areas. So you have all of that. And then you go over there and all of a sudden it's like you don't have those creature comforts anymore. You know, um, you have something to be fixed. The guy says, a plumber, you might say, hey, listen, I need a plumber. The plumber might say, yeah, I'll be there in an hour. And the plumber shows up five hours later or the next day, you know, and time over there being a little bit more fluid in terms of how they look at things, you know, just like in the Caribbean, you know, over here, the plumber says, I'm going to show up at two o'clock. Okay. He may show up a little bit late if he shows up late at all. And it's like, you know, over here, we're like willing to chew out because he showed up five minutes late. But you go to a place like Ghana, they're showing up five hours later, they're showing up the next day, they're showing up two weeks later. And you're like, what in the world? And not everyone can handle that. Not everyone is cut out for that kind of setback. Not everyone is cut out for, wow, what's going on? You know, mosquitoes are eating me up. Uh, I don't have an air conditioner. You know, um, what, what, you know? And you go out on the roads and the roads are not the greatest in the world. There's a bunch of accidents, a lot of dirt roads and, and, and so on going on. Of course, the country again, it's still a developing country. It's getting there. But if you're leaving from the conveniences and the modernism that you may have here in the United States, where things that you may take for granted and you go over there, you might find certain things are still in the developmental stage and some people are just not cut out to deal with that right now. We're in the United States. It's give it to me now. We want it now. I must have it now. And then to go to a place where you don't have that anymore, it throws a lot of people for a loop. So people are going over there and the pipe dream or dreams that they thought was going to happen over there is just not working out. It's taking longer. They're running out of money. Um, they find themselves in situations. And then you have the other group of people who go over there and they really can't come back. You know, they don't have the money to come back. There's a problem there. They left. They basically burned all their bridges and they went over there and now they're somewhat stuck and they have got to get caught up into the way of life over there. They may start involving themselves in scamming. They may start involving themselves in land schemes and, and whatever is going on and it creates a problem. Then there's this other issue that goes on where there are people, whether they know it or not, they may not be aware. They may be aware but they're doing it subconsciously where they look at Africa like Africa is a country. Africa is not a country. And so there's this, this, this idea, especially like my, uh, my relative, he believes that someday all of Africa will unite. And I keep telling him, I said, please 
don't fall for that pipe dream. No such thing is going to happen. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I said it's not going to happen most likely. And I tell them the reasons why it's not going to happen is that in the past, when you united a place, you united a vast area known as a empire, there was usually one person who rose up and just started conquering the different people in his neighborhood. Then he stretched out his neighborhood, conquered some other people. And before you know it, he had a huge empire, but he had to subjugate a bunch of people to bring them onto his rule, whether it be Genghis Khan, whether it be Cyrus of Persia, whether it be um, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, whether it be Alexander of Greece. You know, all of these things had to happen. You had to subjugate, you had to get, get nasty. You had to shed blood to basically bring all these people under your control. Well, is that going to happen in Africa today? Is it out of the realm of possibility? Not really. The other way it's going to happen is for all these countries that are there now to give up their sovereignty, like the United States. Like how the United States is kind of set up, but that's a whole other reason of how they became a United States. But, or United States. But there in Africa, these are a bunch of countries. So South Africa would have to give up its sovereignty to a central power somewhere. You know, Ethiopia would have to give up its sovereignty to some central power somewhere else. And I could not see these countries saying, all right, we're not going to have a president anymore. Uh, let's just go ahead and set up a central location in Botswana. And that's where the president will be or that's where the king will be. And we will all basically bow um, in, 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 in servitude or, or sub subject ourselves of subjects of this one central location. I can't see that happening. Number two, there are a bunch of different religions in Africa, you know, and there are competing religions like in places like Nigeria, northern Nigeria, primar primarily um, Af um, Muslim and southern Nigeria, predominantly Christian. Then you have so many different regions that are vastly different from one another that have their own experience just based on the location of where they are. So you look at a place like Libya, Libya has more in common Libya on the African continent has more in common with, say, Iraq on the Asian continent than it does, Libya, than it does with, say, Angola, than it does with, say, Tanzania, okay? It has less in common with countries on its own continent, on the same continent that it's sharing, and have more in common with a country on another continent because, primarily, of religion. And the ethnic groups that are there. So now to turn around and think that Libya all of a sudden is going to want to be a part of some organization with, say, South Africa or, or, or Uganda, you know, while they can interact, but to say a unity between them, to say that one is going to give up their sovereignty so that the other would be ruling over them, that's not going to really happen. So I keep telling him all the time to just get rid of that pipe dream out of his head. That's not something that's going to happen. So... When it comes down to these type of things, people are looking on and they're thinking Africa is a country. And then there's a thing that's going on here. You have to understand that a lot of these African nations were brought together. I shouldn't say were brought together. A lot of these African uh, tribes, the people who live there, the local people who live there, they were parts of kingdoms. And sometimes these kingdoms didn't like each other and had wars, fought, didn't care for each other. One may have lived across on one side of the river and the other lived on the other side, but they had their separate areas that they ruled over, they governed, that's their people over there, that's those people over there. When the Europeans came in, the Europeans created these artificial borders and basically said, well, all of you, I know you guys don't get along there, like hundreds of you guys, a bunch of different tribes, and we're going to slap all of you within these borders and you guys are going to become one nation. So when you had this one nation type of thing, now you have leaders coming in who are trying to build a national identity, but you had tribes who were like, I don't want to be a part of that. This is our group over here. We don't, we don't want to be a part of, we don't want to be associated with, with you. You come from this particular tribe. You guys were our enemies for, for hundreds of years. We don't want to have anything to do with you. Or we didn't mind coexisting with you, but you're not going to tell me that you're going to be the place where the central seat of power is going to be and our tribe is not going to have whatever. Nigeria is a perfect example of this. And you have Nigeria as a place where the British had a protectorate to the north and a protectorate to the south. When the British left, 
they put these two um, areas together where the southern portion was more Anglo and more or less followed the Christian religion, whereby the northern part was more Muslim. So you now have a government and they're trying to build a national identity. Now it's more national, right? And then you have people in the southern part of, um, of Nigeria and they're looking around and it's like, well, no, we don't want to be a part of this, you know? Who says we want to be a part of just because the Europeans put us together? No, we want to have our own spot. Well, the national government looked around and like, no, we want you to be a part of a nation. You're no longer going to be into this tribal thing. Well, of course, you know, that led to war. Not to mention the fact that oil was discovered off the coast of Nigeria. So those tribes living in that area, oil is found in areas where they live. So when the government came in and was like, whoa, you have oil down there? Well, that oil now is a part of the national treasury, if you want to call it that. It's part of the nation. It's not part of your tribe. So then the way to pacify these tribes, you will go down and say, okay, listen, let us drill. Let's do whatever we have to do. And you'll get some kickbacks from all of this. You guys, we're all going to be, we're all going to benefit from this. Did that work out? No. The next thing you know, the president is getting rich. His boys are getting rich. You know, they're from some other tribe. They're controlling the oil wells down there and they're making all the money. And the local people in the area looking around like, we're not benefiting from this. What do you call it? What happens now? Tension. What does it lead to? Civil war. These are the type of struggles that's going on in Africa and, and, and so on. So when people come to me and say to me, okay, well, I shouldn't say people, but my cousin looking at me like, why am I not going to a place like Africa? These are some of the reasons. Do I love Africa? Yes. Do I read a lot about Africa? Yes. Are there wonderful places in Africa? Yes. Would I love to visit Africa? Yes. Would I live in Africa? Yes. Now, the latter part of what I just said there, when I said, it, would I live in Africa? Yes. If I didn't have a family to worry about, if I was still a 20-year-old, intrepid, adventurous, don't mind being a part of building up a nation, sure, I could go to some of these countries because I'm not really a fussy person. Is it hot outside? Do I have an air conditioner? It really doesn't matter to me. Do I have a fan? That's all I need. You know, um, I'll figure it out. I don't mind walking on the dirt roads. Remember, I grew up in a rural area. I don't mind going out and having to go down to the ocean and getting my fish down there. I, I don't mind going through all of the various things that I would have to do. You know, um, getting away from the creature comforts. That I don't mind. I've done it before and I don't mind doing it now. But I have a family. I have a young child. I have a wife. Do I want to put them through that? Do I want them to go through that type of thing, especially when they're accustomed to this? Not really. So I have to think about them also. So Portugal is more of a ready-made place for us. And what I mean by ready-made is that Portugal has its issues. It has its financial issues. It does. But one thing I do know is that when it comes to certain things, their infrastructure is in place. They have great roads. I wouldn't have to worry about potholes and a whole lot of other things that's going on. I wouldn't have to worry about medical care. I wouldn't have to worry about the educational system. Um, those things are pretty much in place, established, and are considered great by indexes around the world. Whereby in Ghana, these are places, or Nigeria, or whatever, these are places that may be spectacular 50 years from now. But for right now, they're still going through their growing stages. They're still going through a growing phase. And I don't want to be a part of that at this very moment. Okay? So I need to go someplace where things are ready-made. Portugal happens to be one of those places. Again, despite their own troubles, um, I know when I go over there, I can find great public transportation. I know when I drive on the roads, I'll be driving on relatively smooth roads that has no problems. I don't have to worry about the power going off. I don't have to worry about the internet being unstable or shaky or whatever. Um, I don't have to worry about the things that may be going on in these emerging countries where people are looking for a way to survive. And as they're looking for a way to survive, sometimes you may have um, heightened um, petty crime around because people are trying to make it, you know, just make it, you know. Um, I mean, I have to deal with stuff like that in Portugal. So these are the reasons why at this stage of my life and at this um, structure of my life, a family man, 
I have a young child, I have a wife, why I would prefer to go to a place like Portugal where I can just kind of like move right on in and just basically resume a life that I've known over here. Again, there are going to be some changes. There are going to definitely be some differences. But it won't be that steep learning curve. Like, I leave the United States, and it's like I'm going to a place in Africa. And again, there, if I had the money, you have to understand. If I had the money, and I could go over there, I can find neighborhoods in, 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 uh, in Africa that remind me of Bal Harbor down here in Miami, where there's filthy rich people down there. I can go there, gated communities, nice house, pool in the back. Um have a nice car out front, living life fantastically great, okay? I can go and find those places over there. I don't have that kind of money. So I'm just going to be a regular everyday person dealing with their regular everyday struggles, which again, I wouldn't mind doing, but I just don't want to put my family through that. So going to a place like Portugal, it's like this. This might be the United States and Portugal might be here. So yeah, I might have to take a little step down, maybe in certain regards, but for the most part, it's not that big of a drop. Now, I may go someplace in Africa and just being a regular, everyday, you know, bloke just walking around the place, the gap may be more like this. And now it's a lot of things I've got to consider that I'm going to be losing in the process to come over. There may be some gains in some ways, of course, obviously. But then I'm going to realize that I'm going to have to go dealing with what I'm dealing with right now, hot weather, you know, um, perhaps no AC where I live, um, you know, um, not to mention the fact the cost of living may be higher. Um, in some regard, you know, you might go over there and you might say, hey, whatever. But the things that I may be accustomed to, like one guy was pointing out, I may be doing, um, I may be doing a, um, something like this and I may need like a shore or, or a road, road microphone, you know, and it's like over here, I might go and pick one up from, I don't know, any store, Walmart, wherever I may go pick up something like that over here and it may cost me $60, you know, because they're just around. Um, and I go to Ghana and I need a microphone like that. It may cost me $500. Those are the type of things. Now, again, food and so forth may be very cheap. I can always go find fresh food in a place like in a market in Ghana, in a market in Nigeria, in a market in Senegal. I can find that cheap in that regard. But when it comes around to the things that I may want to need, I may need like a microphone or I might want to have a nice car or things that may be imported, it may cost me an arm and a leg to get those type of things. Of course, this is also the situation in places like Portugal in some regard with certain things. So these are things that I would definitely have to consider. So when it comes to Africa right now, it's a part of my heritage, obviously, just like Madeira is, just like Portugal is. It's a bigger part of my, um, my own heritage. I do know that. It's, there are places there I would love to go. I really, really want to go, which is why if we move to Portugal, first place I'm going to is Morocco. Then, of course, from Morocco, I would like to go down to places like Ghana or Mozambique, which is a country I seem to have a fascination with. I would love to go to Kenya. You know, I'll be much closer. These are places I would love to go to visit. And maybe at some point in time, maybe a consideration. You know, if I'm around 50 years from now, you know, 40 years from now, as these places develop into into top-notch places it might be like yeah i think i want to go and move into a place like kenya or a place like ghana but for right now that is not the situation and it has nothing to do with me looking down in africa it has nothing to do with me thinking that the, that europe is so superior and, and 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 everything of course in certain ways you can say i'm not talking about in terms of people mind you but you know infrastructure you know, but it's not me going around like, oh, well, I hate Africa. and Oh, oh my God. You know, I don't have that, that thing. I don't believe. And I know better. Africans are not all living in huts. They're not all walking around barefoot. The common knowledge that some people will have. I do realize that there are beautiful places there. There are places over there that in some places in the United States can make over here in some parts of the United States look like a dump. You know, so I do realize this. But for right now, in terms of what I need to get going to be able to hit the ground running, Africa and certain places, again, unless I had the money, it's just not the place for me. A place like Portugal, it could be Spain, it could be France, it could be Germany. I can somewhat hit the floor running and don't have to worry about certain things that I would have to worry about in a place like Africa. So I just want you to mention this and based on the title, why not Africa? You know, why Portugal? Well, now you would understand why. Okay. Anyway, I'm burning up. I want to thank you for listening in on this video. I've got to go clean this car out to vacuuming it out. 
um, some issues that I have back here. So I really, really thank you guys for tuning in. Um, I hope you understood where I was coming from. And um, another time I'll do another video regarding some of these other things, some of these things that I spoke about. Because of course I've also had people, what about race? What about what's going on over there? And they're quite aware, they've seen the videos, the soccer matches where, you know, you have people in the crowd acting like real assholes, you know, against African players and they see that. And unfortunately, sometimes we see stuff like that and people determine that the entire country must feel that way or that stadium of 50,000 people represent a population of 20 million people, you know, and um, is representative of their attitudes. Um, while there may be some latent behaviors there, um, some latent ideas or feelings or vibes, um, I don't really know. But um, this sometimes sticks in some people's minds and then they get the impression that is all of Europe and that's what's going on there. You can find those stories, mind you. Um, but I just take each situation as it com comes along. I try to go ahead and put my respect out there and I try not to go ahead and look for racism on every rock you know if I'm being an idiot and I go out there and I do something and somebody scowls at me or yells at me doesn't mean that they're racist toward me it's just I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing or or something that is against the tradition or the customs there you know so you do have situations like that also anyway that will be for another topic okay you guys take care again thank you so much for tuning in I really appreciate it let me get out of this hot car okay Thank you for tuning in to Mad About Madeira. Really appreciate it. Like, share if you'd like to, and comment. I would love to see that, okay? Take care. Bye-bye.